Glad to be at church today. Welcome, welcome. Very grateful to be gathered together with all of you today and all of you at our Hocassin location and joining us online from wherever you are throughout uh, our region or around the country or the world. We're very glad that you're here and uh, I am glad to be back. And uh, yeah, thanks. And uh, if, you're, if you're new to Real Church for Real People, I'm glad you're here. I've been uh, away for a few weeks, had some vacation time with my family, and then has spent a couple of weeks kind of working behind the scenes and studying and preparing for our summer series, which I'm very excited about. And uh, I'm just so grateful for all of you, all of our leaders, our staff here, all of you who serve on the J team, and you pray, and you invite, and you're engaged in what God is doing here. I've, I've never been more grateful for um, so many of you who are, who are leaning in, and, and thank you for who you are and all you do. And, and thanks for, for letting me have a little vacation. I was thinking, I didn't share this uh, earlier in the weekend. We started our weekend, of course, here in Newark on Saturday night. I didn't share this, but I had this thought this morning. Someone said, man, I'm so glad you got a vacation. I remembered that a pastor told me uh, once about a, uh, an experience he had where a woman came up to him in his church and said, hey, I don't really think you should take time off. And he said, well, why? And she said, well, the devil doesn't take time off. And immediately the pastor said, yeah, and look at him. I mean, his attitude's terrible. Like, oh, is that? So anyway, thank you for letting me take some time off. Uh, so if you are new to our church, that was, that was free. Uh, if you are new to our church, uh, we have a very simple focus here. We help people find Jesus and follow him fully by gathering, connecting, and serving. Three environments in which we can get to know God better and get to know each other better and and make a difference in the world around us. And we've been talking over the past few weeks about how we're making room for more people to experience that this fall uh, by taking some steps during the summer. Here at our Newark location, making the switch to Saturday nights, trying that out. And uh, some people have been doing that. If you haven't heard about that and you usually come on Sunday to Newark, we'd love to have you join us on Saturday night, our Hokessin location, investing in the lives of people outside of uh, of church walls and inviting them to experience God with you, and a bunch of you are doing that at Hokessin. And then for if you live or work south of the canal, uh, praying about taking that step to become a part of the launch team for our Middletown location, which is coming this fall, which, yeah, very excited about that. And for all of you taking any of those steps, it's a big deal. I'm proud of you. Thank you for that. And then I just want to take one moment more and celebrate another group of people specifically. This past Wednesday, 43 leaders graduated from our Journey Leadership Institute <laughs> evening program. Yeah, show them some love. And uh, we had an amazing evening together. They have spent the last nine months uh, in a leadership intensive in this environment where they're learning to become uh, more and more empowering leaders who change our region for Jesus, church and the marketplace and home and just in every environment. And I'm very proud of them. And I uh, want to encourage you that if you want to take steps in your leadership and learn how to lead from a faith perspective, a faith foundation, our fall round of the evening program, the applications for that will open up in a couple of weeks. And I really encourage you to take that step, something I'm very, very passionate about. And I've seen just the the transformation it brings to people's lives. So as we jump into this brand new series called Starter Kit, uh, which is aimed at helping us find the tools we need to build our faith, I want to do a quick poll, all right, all of our locations and online. How many of us like to cook, all right? How many of us like to cook? You like to cook? So just keep a hand up, you know, just you know, check it out where I'm going for dinner and just... Okay, how many of us, how many of us like to grill specifically? We like to grill. So I do not like to cook. I love to grill. And I don't know if you've noticed, for a lot of guys, grilling is kind of sacred. If you've ever had a man try to kind of hover or take over while you were grilling on your grill, you know how difficult that moment, how tense it can become. Like, back off. I have an oversized spatula. I know how to use it. <laughs> Step away from my grill. You can observe from a distance. I do not need your advice. <laughs> Come on, you guys, you know what I'm talking about. Like, don't. You know, if you move that a little to the right, you know what? If you went home. Anyways, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm, just, I'm totally, I'm just being serious. So, um, <laughs> so every griller, if we're honest, first of all, we love to share our success stories. We think you're interested. I know you're not, but we like to tell you about the, the steaks we seared to perfection three years ago, summer of, of 2020, you know, just, and uh, we love to tell that. But we also, if we're honest, every griller has a disaster story. How many grillers have a grill disaster story? Yeah. So I have one. I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed to share with you. Um, I was a charcoal griller. I'm not anymore, but for a lot of years. And I was a purist. 
Some of you know what I mean, no lighter fluid. All right, so you, f- you figure out how to start your coals and you kind of work it, and it's a whole process. And we had a bunch of people over to our house uh, one time, and 45 minutes after the food was supposed to be prepared, I had not gotten the charcoals hot enough. And of course, I would not use any lighter fluid or anything like that. 45 minutes after the food was supposed to be done, I was still cooking. And my wife was like, hey, um, you know, at first we're going to order food, and then you might want to find somewhere else to sleep tonight, and all of these things, you know. <laughs> And I was like, baby, if you just hold on, just give me another seven hours, and we'll have burgers, I promise. It's going to be great. Grilling disaster story. So whether we enjoy cooking or grilling or not, here's what we all know. We all know that a good meal requires time to prepare. It requires patience. It requires effort. It requires resilience. It requires the right tools. If you've ever tried to cook and not had the right utensils and things you need, you know how frustrating it can be. But when it comes to building our faith, so often for so many of us, whatever our experience with God or church in the past, we begin to think that God should just serve us a meal rather than expecting us to cook. That's kind of how we come to God. In fact, how many of us, you don't have to raise your hand on this one, but have, have, might not have put it in these words, but we're like, God, just tell me when my life is ready. Like, just tell me when all the good things you have for me are just, they're all cooked up and ready, and then I will, I will devour them happily, but I don't necessarily want to be involved in the process because the process requires patience. And the problem is that can lead to a faith disaster. And by the way, I want to be clear here, certainly we don't control the process. We need to, need to abandon our lives to the care and gracious uh, provision of God. That's what trust is. But then God invites us to participate with him. Put it this way, we cannot grow without God. He will not grow us without us. So he wants us to participate in the process. And there's a book in the New Testament of the Bible called the book of James that speaks to this. It's very direct, very practical. And I really believe that during this series, God can speak through this little book in the Bible. We're going to be in it five weekends, beginning this weekend. God can speak to it through us or or to us through it wherever we are spiritually. So let's jump in. And by the way, I actually taught on this text a few months ago, the first verse. We're going to read that again, but then we're going to get into some new things that we haven't looked at yet. So James writes this. He says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. In other words, God's going to make it clear that they belong to him. He's going to show his affirmation. He's going to bless them if they patiently endure. People who patiently endure testing and temptation. Now, there is a word in there that I love, the word bless. How many of us would say we want to be blessed by God? We want to be blessed by God. Okay, here in Newark, that's about 50%. So how many of us say we want to be cursed by God? Can I just see a show of hands? All right, so how many of us would say we want to be, those are the two options. How many of us would say we want to be blessed by God? Just by show of, okay, good. Now we've got widespread participation. Okay, so I want to be blessed by God. I know some of us are a little funny, like, I don't know if I'm all about that blessing stuff. I hear you, but I'm definitely not all about that cursing stuff. So that's just kind of where I land. And I believe God wants to bless us. Great word. It's okay. It's okay to desire to be blessed. It's okay to ask God to bless us. That is okay. But there is another word in there I don't love, and it goes along with the word bless. I wish it didn't, but it does. The word patiently. Patiently. That is not a great word. I don't love that word. Patience is hard for me. Anybody else? Took you too long. All right, so patience (laughs) is difficult for me. I do not want to be patient. It does not come naturally to me. I would prefer things to be done quick, to to not require endless waiting And so often in our experience with God, long periods of waiting, long periods of doing the right thing in the absence of meaningful results, trusting, being faithful to God, doing right things even in the absence of right feelings. And just like great cooking, to get a great meal, that requires Patience. You say, no, it doesn't. You just pop it in the microwave. I've had great meals that were in little plastic compartments and you just peel back the cellophane. No, you have not. That is not even food. (laughs) A great meal requires patience. And listen, so does building a great life. It requires 
resilience and patience and the right tools. And there are two things that James says we need patience for. A lot of things we need patience for, but two things in particular, two categories of things we're going to face in this life, testing and temptation. And we all go through tests. You may be going through one right now in a relationship or at work or in your finances or your mental health. You're being tested in some areas and it's hard to see your way forward and the good news is for all who patiently endure the tests of life keeping their faith in Jesus God will bless us it is a promise I don't know how long it will take and what it will require and by the way that does not just mean God will give us everything we think we want it means God will provide all we truly need he will bless us it's a promise from God but God does not just bless those who patiently endure testing. He blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. So I want to talk about the temptation part this weekend. And remember, when you are being tempted, not if, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. And James does not say, when you're being tested, don't say, God is testing me. He says, when you're being tempted, don't say God is tempting me. Why? Because God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. So I'm going to ask you another question, and this one may require some courage, especially in church. But how many of us, raise your hand, if at any point in your life you have felt like God might be out to get you? Me too. You had a season when stuff just stacked up and issues seemed so difficult and you were in pain, physical, mental, relational, and you just begin to wonder, is God out to get me? Is he, is he tempting me right now? Is he, is he trying to see me fail? You may not even be sure what you believe about God exactly, but you've had moments when you've thought, if there is a God, he is not playing fair. This is like, this can't be right. James wants us to remember when we are struggling with the tests and temptations of this life that God may be testing us, but he is never tempting us. So the temptation we experience does not come from God. See, a test is when God says you are about to enter a season where there will be a lot of hard questions and the answers will not immediately be provided. That's a test. And again, some of us may be going through one right now. It's part of life. But temptation is when, in the middle of a test, we suddenly are given an opportunity to cheat, to take a shortcut. And we are all tempted. Again, James says, not if you are tempted, but when you are tempted. A temptation is, I'm in the middle of a test. Life is not making sense. Maybe I'm discouraged or I'm tired or I have these, these longings in my life and they're not being fulfilled. It's taking too long. Let me pop, let me peel back the cellophane, pop my life in the microwave and call it food. It's a temptation. Let me take a shortcut. I don't want to have to cook right now. I, I want it easier. I want it faster. Put it this way. God gives us recipes. Temptation hands us a menu. And says, oh, it's easy. Just pick, pick from the menu. Pull into the drive-thru. In fact, let's biggie size it today. <laughs> you know what? If we're, gonna, if we're here, let's go. Let's just, let's, I mean, let's, let's get the extra large fries today, spiritually speaking. Nothing wrong with fries, by the way. In fact, there's a reason, if you're in New York, you should come on Saturday nights. We had like a, an ice cream truck last night. People are like, you cannot preach about temptation and then offer us ice cream. <laughs> but I just want to be clear, nothing wrong with fries and ice cream. I'm using them as an analogy. So God says, here are some hard questions. It's a test. I'm not going to give you easy answers right away. But if you will patiently build your faith, I will bless you in the end. It's a promise. Temptation says that's going to take too long and hurt too much and require too much sacrifice. So instead, let me give you a menu of options that God does not desire for you and does not want for you. But if you pick one of them, you can get what you want quicker. And the reason the menu is so tempting is because it seems easier than enduring the test. It's a shortcut. Now, it is not weird to be tempted. 
All of us are tempted with many things. We all get offered the menu. We live in a world where the menu of temptation is constantly flashed in front of us. Shortcut, 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 less than God's best, do this, in, indulge in that, go over here, get connected to this, it'll give you what you want. But the menu is not the meal. It is not wrong to be tempted. James says, you're going to be tempted. There's a menu of stuff that God does not want for us, what is referred to in the Bible as sin. You may not love that word, word but you do believe in that concept. Even if you're an atheist, you believe in sin because you are convinced the person who lives three doors down is engaged in it. <laughs> right? We all believe in sin. We just are not quite sure we are guilty of any. But we all believe in it. James says this menu of sin is going to be flashed in front of you on a regular basis, but if you have put your faith in God through Jesus Christ, you do not have to order off the menu anymore. I do not have to order off the menu anymore. Now it is a choice. Before we knew Jesus, it was not a choice. We were, we were driven by our sinful desires and temptations, but now we know Jesus. We have the power by his grace to not order off that menu. And here's the interesting thing. Temptation does not come from God. James says God has never been tempted. But even though God was never tempted, Jesus was. So what's up with that? We know Jesus was and is God. But he became human and really human. It was not just an act. He put on flesh and blood. He became just like us. And in his humanity, he faced every temptation that we will ever face. The menu of temptation was flashed in front of Jesus. It was so alluring. It was, this is how you can get what God has for you, but so much quicker and so much easier without the sacrifice. And Jesus saw the menu and never ordered from it. He never gave in to sin. He's the only human person who has never given in to temptation, which means when he died to forgive our sins, it was as a perfect sacrifice, a perfect replacement for us. But he was no longer just God who could never be tempted. He became human, went through the temptation we face and said, this is how you can live your life now. If you're with me, the menu can be flashed in front of you and you can decide to follow God's recipe instead. So, testing comes from God. Sometimes God tests us. Temptation does not come from God. So where does it come from? James thought you'd ask. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. They lure us in and carry us off. Now, hold on a minute. I thought temptation came from the devil. I've been blaming him my whole life. <laughs> What's up with this? Well, temptation does come from the devil in one sense. In Jesus' case, it came directly from the devil. But for most of us, most times, it actually doesn't. In our case, the devil doesn't have to work as hard because we have all allowed some desires to remain in our lives that are not good. All of us, we have sinful desires. Now, maybe for some of you, you're saying, ah, it may be true for some people, I do not have any sinful desires. You do have one. You have the sinful desire to lie in church. <laughs> so we, just so we're all on the same page, we... Oh, I have sinful desires. You have sinful desires. And when we don't recognize that that's true about us, those desires get an advantage over us, and they end up enticing us and dragging us away. And here's what's complicated about it. And here's the compassion of God. Listen very closely. What's complicated about it, and the reason temptation is so hard to resist, is that underneath a lot of our desires, mine included, there are longings for things that God actually does want for us. But what happens is that our desires, which are shortcuts, get layered on top of these longings, and we don't take those longings to the only one who can really meet them. So here's what I mean. Underneath a greedy or fearful desire to obsess over money, which is unhealthy and Scripture would say is sinful, there is an important longing for real success and security. Underneath 
a desire for shallow and disconnected sex that doesn't respect our own bodies or the person we're with. There is a real longing for real joy and intimacy. Underneath the desire for power to control other people and circumstances, to manipulate and to get our own way, there is a longing for real authority and purpose. And God desires those things for us. Real success, not shallow, not net worth success, real worth success. Security, not like I've got enough money in the bank account, like I've got a big enough God that he will take care of me, whatever comes. Joy, not like I feel pleasure in the moment, like my inner world is at peace. Intimacy, not like I'm using this person or this image or this environment just to get what I need, but I'm in a covenant relationship. Authority, like God called me to reign over parts of the earth and to have influence and purpose. I know why I'm here. God wants those things for us, but when we're tested, God says, I know what your soul needs. I'm the only one who does because I created you. So I'm giving you a recipe so that you can begin to have the tools to build the life you really want. Temptation says, no, 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 forget the recipe. Here's a menu. You don't have to cook. You could just order in. Uber Eats, baby. Again, just an analogy, nothing wrong with Uber Eats. But spiritually speaking. So to patiently endure temptation, listen, we've got to, by the grace of God, stop ordering off the menu of our own desires. We've got to create a pause where we go, okay, I may be going through a test, and God may be allowing and approving of that test. But the temptation that's coming in the middle of the test, that's not from God. My own desires are getting in the way of God's desires for me. Let me take a pause and take my longings to God. See, temptation is always an invitation to take a shortcut. And when we take a shortcut, it always cuts short what God was trying to do in our lives. So we got to stop ordering off that menu. And when we order off the menu of temptation, our desires entice us and drag us away. Why does that matter? Because the next thing that happens is where we really start to experience harm. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. Now, that does not necessarily mean it kills us physically immediately. But it ends up killing the things we were trying to chase after. And the the real longings that were under them, our relationships begin to die. How we see God. Some of us are so angry at God and so messed up about God. Because we've, we've never brought our longings to him and now how we change it's changed how we see God death comes to the things that really matter when we keep ordering off the menu of temptation now if you don't know what you believe about God and the Bible yet you may not buy any of this Um, and I get that I'm not going to try to talk you into it you don't have to believe this to come here But for all of us who have said yes to following Jesus, listen, this is part of the starter kit of our faith, the tools to respond to temptation. First, we've got to let go of the shame that we feel when the menu is flashed in front of us. Some of us are struggling with this. We think things like, if I was a good person, I wouldn't even be tempted with that. That is not true. Jesus was without sin, and he was tempted to do awful things. He just didn't order off the menu. In this world, you are going to be tempted. Some of us are like, I'll know I'm spiritually mature when I am no longer tempted. No, you will know you are dead and in heaven when you are no longer tempted. (laughs) So we've got to let go of the shame. But then second, we've got to recognize, underneath this unhealthy desire, there's a real longing and if I just try to stop sinning without recognizing what I, my soul is looking for and learning to take that to God, I'm just going to repeat the same cycles. I've got to take what my soul really needs to God and to community with God's people and to purpose on this planet. And then third, we stop ordering off the menu of temptation and we return to the recipe God has given us to build our faith. It's why we gather like this, why we connect in groups, why we serve and make a difference. It's why we read God's word. It's why we pray. It's why we share our faith. It's why we choose who and what we spend our time with and on wisely. 
Why? Because we're not interested in the menu. We're committed to the recipe. Okay, last part. Ready? Here's what James says. Don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. I, I, want, I need you to get this, he says. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God, our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. In other words, James says, don't be misled. I don't want you to get this wrong. God is good. And he wants what is good for us. And it's not like God is on Mondays, like, I want what's good for you. But then on Tuesdays, he's like, no, I'm not so sure. And Wednesday's like, maybe. And Thursday's like, oh, I'm all in. And then Friday, he's back on the fence. No, he never changes. He is good. He desires what is good for us. The problem comes when our desires get in the way of God's desires. So I want to show you what this looks like when it comes to cooking. So in our family... Um, we love home-cooked meals. We love enjoying a meal together. It's a value to us. We love sitting around the table. We love that all that process is important to us. We, we like eating out, but we don't want to do that all the time. The problem is none of us are exactly chefs. So it's a true story. None of us are really gifted at kind of creating meals from scratch, and so we have this tension. So a few years ago, we began ordering meal starter kits. And... Uh, I am, and for the low, low price of, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not promoting. So this is one we use, but if you, I'm not promoting it. If you have a bad experience, email them, not me. Okay, so here, seriously, please. Um, so, but we use this particular one. We've had great experiences with it, but here's how it works, okay? And there are lots of others out there, but here's how it works. It's changed our world. A box arrives on our doorstep, and it costs 28% less than groceries is what it always says. Um, HelloFresh, I am, you know, seeking a side hustle. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. So anyway, a box arrives on our doorstep and inside there are three meal kits. Not the meals. These are not pre-prepared, but there'll be a protein. There'll be chicken or beef or uh, something like that. There'll, there'll be uh, grain. There'll be rice. There'll be quinoa. Just kidding. I know what quinoa is. <laughs> Told you, I'm not a chef. All that's in there. There are ingredients to make sauces. There are spices. There are vegetables, Brussels sprouts, potatoes, all those things. And inside every box... There is this card. On one side, it says, this is what you want. This is the life you are looking for. And on the other side, it says, this is how you get there. Right? So even though it's a starter kit, it comes with ingredients and instructions, but there is still a lot of work that we have to do. We got to slice, we got to dice, we got to saute. And then in the middle of preparing that meal sometimes, like when we first started getting them, it would say, you know, this particular one says it takes 45 minutes to cook. I don't even know. This is like a top of the line kind of thing. I'm not even sure. I can't remember when we had this one. But anyway, we're ordering it again. Note to self. Uh, but this one says it takes 45 minutes to cook, 10 minutes to prep, 45 minutes to cook. We first started getting these. That would take us an hour and 17 minutes. <laughs> but now it's like we're skilled. We know. But we had moments like, what is creme fraiche? Like, I don't know what that is. We, what is that? And then it tells you. And if you don't know, you need a meal delivery kit. It will change your world. So ingredients and instructions, still a lot of work, slicing, dicing, sauteing, mixing, preparing. This goes nine minutes. Don't let this overcook. It's this whole process. And in the middle of doing that, there's a, there's, it's a test. And the temptation is to order pizza. <laughs> I'm just telling you, it would be faster, it'd be easier, but it would not help us learn our way around the kitchen. I'm just telling you, I know it's so simple, but this is how God wants to help you build your faith this summer. He wants to give you a starter kit. We're going to unpack it during this series. And this is actually one, the first of three series this summer where we're going to go there. What we believe, the foundation our faith is built on, how we can experience the power of God in real ways in our everyday lives. But God wants to give you this starter kit, and he has provided the ingredients and the instructions 
And the goal is that you would patiently endure until the meal is complete so that he can bless you. That's what he desires for you. Which means for any of us who have ever said anything like, you know what I need? I need a, I'm looking for a church where I can be fed. That's not quite right. What you and I need is a church where we are lovingly expected and equipped to learn to cook. <laughs> One of the temptations is go find a church where everything is just geared toward you, where you just show up peel back the cellophane, and press two minutes. God says, no, once you get in a community of faith, where over time you're given ingredients and instructions, but you start to learn your way around the kitchen. So if, you, if you're new to all of this, maybe tune this out for a minute, but I want to speak to some of us who have been doing this for a while. Read your Bible. I don't just show, well, man, I expect that pastor to quote 38 scriptures on the, he didn't quote enough scriptures because I don't read any of it Monday through Saturday. And so, no, read the Bible. Is everybody okay? It got super quiet right there. <laughs> pray. Well, we don't, you know, we should pray more at church. Sure we should, but you should pray more on Tuesday afternoon when you want to punch your coworker. That's when you should pray more. All right. Okay. <laughs> Why does this matter? Because to patiently endure, listen, here's the starter kit. Here's the tool for this weekend. We've got to stop ordering off the menu of our own desires. And then we've got to start building our faith with the ingredients and instructions that God provides. You're going to have to get engaged in this spiritual life for it to really take shape. And maybe you're going to take the summer off from a lot of things. But I'm encouraging you today to take the summer on when it comes to your faith. And I want to give you three very quick, simple ways you can do that. And there are lots of them, but I want to give you three. If you're looking for a next step, how do I apply this? Build your faith this summer. The first one, you heard us talk about it a few minutes ago. Lead a J group. First of all, I really have a heart here because of what I just described, to not just be a crowd that gathers on the weekend. We need these small groups of people doing life together. And if you'll lead a J group, it's, it's like going from just eating a meal to learning your way around the kitchen a little bit. And you don't have to have all the answers. We'll give you the ingredients and instructions. Summer's a very simple time to lead. It's more laid back. It's only a seven-week semester. But just create some space for people to get closer to God, closer to each other. And I really believe God will work through that in your life and help you grow as you help others grow. Lead a J group. Here's the second one. We've partnered with the YouVersion app to release a reading plan with this series through the book of James. So it's James and June. <laughs> and I want to challenge you this month. It starts tomorrow. You can find it on our app. Start reading the Bible. Read through the book of, of James and June. You say, I don't even know if I believe the Bible. Cool. Read it. But I have baggage. Great. Bring your baggage to God. He can handle it. But get in God's word. Why? Because those are the instructions. All of us, every single one of us, I don't care what we believe, all of us want the life that the Bible says we can have. But now it's just a question of whether we like the other side of the card. <laughs> Read the Bible. And then if you would say, man, I don't, I'm not ready for even that. Like, I just, I don't know what I believe I'm starting from scratch, I, or my faith needs a do-over, here's what I would encourage you to do. Just come back next weekend. Welcome to the kitchen. Just, just come back. Listen. Just learn. Just soak it in. See what God can do in your life. Your faith in your life do not have to be a grilling disaster story. <laughs> God's given you the ingredients and the instructions. And you can find the tools to build your faith. And you can patiently endure when you learn to stop ordering off the menu of your own desires. Which does not just happen overnight. 
It's a process, but you can get there. You don't have to order off that menu. Some of you have lived in long-term dysfunction and brokenness, maybe even generational. I'm speaking this over you right now, that if you will put your faith in God this summer, it may not be instant, it may, not, it may require some painful moments of honesty, but God wants to bring freedom to your life. You don't have to order off that menu for the rest of your life. I'm speaking it over you by faith in Jesus' name. You do not have to order off the menu of addiction for the rest of your life. You do not have to order off the menu of broken relationships for the rest of your life. You do not, you do not, you do not. God wants to give you freedom. And in the process, you start building your faith with the ingredients and instructions God provides. And if you would say, week one of this series, I received that. I want that for my life. Would you just shoot your hand up all over the room here in Newark and Hocus? And if you're online, just stretch that hand out toward God wherever you are. And let me pray it over us. Father, we love you and honor you. Would you tell God this with me? God, I gladly receive your word today. And I believe your word today. And I commit to your word today. Give me the power. Stop ordering off the menu of my own desires. Give me the faith to return to the recipe. Building the kind of life that I know you have for me. It may take a long time. It'll be worth it. In Jesus' name. And then let me take one moment more and just speak to any of us in the room, Newark, Hocus, and our online right now. Listen to me very closely. If you don't know God in a real way for yourself, you may have never thought up until now of the stuff that holds you back from being the person that deep down you wish you were. You may have never thought of that as sin. And again, you may not even like that word, but that is how God refers to it. Sin is all the stuff that we've ever thought, said, or done that is less than our best for God and less than God's best for us. But God doesn't just call you out for your sin. Religion will. Many times religion will say, you're a sinner. Have a great day. God says, you are. You're, you're broken. You're disconnected from me. But I can't stand the thought that you would stay there. So God gave his son, Jesus Christ, who died as a perfect sacrifice to forgive your sins. He does it 99.99% forgive your sins. Completely forgives your sins. When you put your faith and trust in him, you become a new person on the inside. And if you want to take that step today, begin following Jesus. I'd love to lead you in a very simple prayer. So right where you are, all of our locations, just I want everyone to join me. Open your heart up to God. And if that's you today, and you want to begin following Jesus, whisper out a prayer of faith, something like this. Jesus, today I surrender my life to you. I hold nothing back. I know that I need you. I believe you died to forgive my sins. I believe you rose again and you're real and I need you. Save me today. And if that's you, while everyone around you stays focused on God, if, if you would say, that's my prayer today, I'm taking that step, I want to begin following Jesus. Would you lift your hand and just hold it up high? If you're here in the room, again, Newark, Hocus, and hold that hand up high. Online, you can type the word faith in the comments, whatever platform you're watching on. Let us know you're taking that step. And I celebrate that with you. It's an amazing, most important decision you've ever made in your life. And then Journey, would you help me? Come on, all of us, let's give Jesus all the praise, all the honor.